Yeah, dude, you're talking about the Bear Grylls Dry Fly Survival Pack. Is what you're describing, right? <laughs> um, yeah, we'll call it the Joe Rotor uh, Dry Fly Survival Pack. Um, so, yeah, the uh, you know I would say you know get three or four liters. Those are cheap, you know, and they 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 have a tangible impact on your ability to fish um, correctly. Okay, um, for especially if people are newer or don't like knots. Putting a fresh tapered leader on, your time is very valuable. That was Joe Roder breaking out the dry fly gear list you'll need for your next trip. Joe is legit, so let's lean into dry flies today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you can, it'd be great if you can share this episode with one other person today. There's a uh, share button on your app right there. Just click over there, click the share button, and let's get out to somebody who needs some serious uh, goodness here on dry flies. Joe Roder from Red's Fly Shop is here to shed some serious light on what it takes to be a good dry fly fisherman. He uh, definitely takes pride in what he does, and you could hear it in today's conversation. Joe describes the exact setup you need to get going and the right gear you need, which Gary Borger book you should have, and why Antonio Gonzalez has a series of flies you must get a hold of, including a, a little BWO that's great. Before we get started, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that are second to none in quality and can be customized for that little extra touch. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get started right now. Angler's Coffee roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. And I'm one of those anglers who's been loving Angler's Coffee. Great tasting, robust, and good to go. They just released a new subscription program, and you can get 20% off this box and all products at anglerscoffee.com. Just use the coupon code WETFLYSWING at checkout to get 20% off of great coffee today. That's anglerscoffee.com. So, without further ado... Here is Joe Roder from RedsFlyShop.com. How's it going, Joe? It's going great, man. I am in my office right now, and if I uh, poke my head up high enough, I can see the river, which oh. is in fantastic shape. Oh, today, man. So. That's right. Yeah, you guys are right on. I've seen some photos. You guys are right on the river, and this is the uh, this is the Yakima? Yeah, Yakima River Canyon. Uh, right um for, for those, I mean, a lot of people haven't heard of the Yakima. Um, it's a good destination. I wouldn't call it a worldwide destination, but um, yeah, it's a it's a good sized Western style stream. Um, you know, basalt rimmed canyon uh, looks a lot like Southern Idaho or the Deschutes. Um, you know, for landscape, I think a lot of people think Washington, and they're like, oh, that's just where all the steelheaders are from, and <laughs> <laughs> you need wool and you need wool and vortex if you're gonna fish there ever and yeah we're actually in the rain shadow we're on the, the east slope of the cascades and uh yeah we have a desert landscape here so i'm looking out at the yakima canyon and uh, i can't see any bighorn sheep from here but uh if that helps people get a yep. kind of a visual of the terrain we're in uh we've got bighorn sheep that are often visible from the shop and lodge here you're an amazing place. I mean, we're we're more on the west side, uh, down just south of you, you know, a bit, uh, and and in the rain. And every time I head over to the east side, it just makes me think, like, man, why 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 do we not live on the east side? You know what I mean? And and there's you know different. And we may we may head out there, but uh, but yeah, I love it, man. We're gonna dig in today to um, I think some dry fly, maybe a little bit of focus on mayflies and, and the Yakima uh, and and reds, right? You guys have one of the biggest fly shops, uh, you know, probably in the country here. Um, but before we get there, talk about how you first got into fly fishing and then how you brought that all into uh, kind of a career in it. Yeah, well, I mean, that could be like an eight chapter podcast all in itself, <laughs> but I'll try to give you the, <laughs> try to give you the condensed version. Uh, 
Yeah, so I, I grew up doing lots of, of fishing and hunting. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, my pedigree is all spin fishing and, and tackle fishing. And then, uh, you know, my brother, my now brother-in-law, my sister's boyfriend at the time, he had a, at that time, we called them fly poles, of course. Um, you know, the $20, you know, Kmart was a big, you know, outdoor purveyor for uh, for us at that time. So pretty much everything came from the, you know, from from Kmart and uh he had a he had a fly rod and uh we fooled around with that a little bit it was cool and uh but i never really you know took off with it uh really until i got to college that was 18 and um uh, i had some experiences prior to that and uh it, it always seemed like somebody's grandfather had a fly rod and it was typically bamboo or fiberglass at that time and uh but man only those old men could make those damn things work and it was like it defied all the laws of physics and logic and reason. And damn, that old man could, he could whip that line around and you know set that fly out at 40 feet delicately. Like it was just magic. And then I remember my, my friend, Tommy Henley, my friend, Tommy's family had a fishing resort on a lake uh, called Silver Lake where, near where I grew up. And old man Henley could, could make that fly rod work. And Tommy and I would just beat the snot out of the water with that thing, trying to cast like his grandpa and we could never make it work. So, I had this fascination or the seed that was planted as a you know young teenager and never really had much success. Thought I was a pretty good fisherman, fished a lot of light tackle bass, and really I, I enjoy kind of the predatory, I still to this day enjoy the predatory element of finesse fishing for bass. But uh, I got to college at Central Washington University here, moved to the east side, got in this desert landscape, and the Yakima River is kind of your, I would say it is a real... Um, like if you were to define a big Western stream, uh, in all of its wildness, the Yakima river has about 75 miles, um, starting from a real narrow, you know, mountainous stream with deep pools, uh, in the headwaters, uh, with, you know, large trout in the headwaters. Um, you know, it's like the double black diamond. They're really hard to catch, but, um, I got, I landed here and went to college at central and had some pretty good mentors that kind of got me really going and man once fly fishing got its hook in me, dude, I was done, man. I was skipping, I was skipping class in college. I actually graduated. I started guiding when I was in college about halfway through and man, I was skipping class to fish. I graduated in three years and two quarters, uh, with a, with a bachelor's just because I was like, this is a problem, man. I've got to fish more. I need to guide more. I mean, I was just, I was sick for it. And I know people say that like, Oh, you know, hashtag sick for it. And yeah, you know, it's like, no, when I was like 20, 21 years old, I mean, it was like problematic. <laughs> and, um, you know, fortunately, I, you know, I never intended to be an outfitter for a living. Um, I always thought I would, you know, go on and use my degree. And I have a degree in, you know, geography and natural resource management. I thought I'd be a forester, land use planner, um, surveyor, uh, fish biologist, or, you know, something. Um, and I guess I'm kind of all that in a sense now that I'm it, an outfitter i could spend all my time outside and you know yep. have a little bit of a hand in policy and advocacy and things like that but uh yeah I, I was i was pretty sick for it man i mean i i fortunately was able to do it as a career so didn't wreck the rest of my life <laughs> yeah that's awesome you know I, I think you're going back to your grandpa and everything it's i always love hearing how people got going which is cool but you know, how'd you bring it into, I don't even know the red story. So you, you guys are just killing it over there at reds and you're the face of reds. Can you talk about how you, that all came to be? Yeah, no, it's, yeah, I guess it's probably good for listeners to have a little background, um, before I start preaching dry fly gospel here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I've been guiding for 20 years, uh, or 21 years, uh, I guess it is. And, uh, I didn't originally start at reds. Reds was, um, uh, essentially a campground, a, a small resort. Um, and then, uh, my now partners, um, bought reds in 2002 from red and Marlene, uh, blanket chip. And, uh, it was a campground and kind of an icon because our property and location is really, really unique. Um, and so it was kind of a local icon and, uh, they bought the property and, um, I wasn't with reds at the time, but I, I, quickly became friends as I was a competitor of Reds uh, at that time and you know met some great dudes that that bought and founded the place um, and uh, built the lodge here um, and uh, in 2012 uh, I came on with Reds in 2000 the end of 2005 
And uh, they we finally got our new existing location uh, built in 2012. But man, I'll tell you, this place is beautiful. But we come from very humble beginnings. Um, we, uh, if if anybody had been to the old Reds or driven by it, it was our original shop here, um, beginning in two, you know, I guess I came on in 2005. We were in a, a mid 1960s uh, single wide trailer. Nice uh, for a long time. And uh, when when you know they were getting ready to build the lodge, we had to move the trailer. And so we hired a mobile home movement company to move our fly shop. I mean, this thing had been there since the 60s, uh, you know, so it was, <laughs> it, was a, it was yeah, it was kind of a it was kind of an odyssey. And, and uh, we en- ended up remodeling an old tool shed on site here. And our shop was literally out of an old tool shed. And we had to move the trash can around to catch the rain or the snow melt through the leaky roof uh, to make sure it didn't get on the floor of the apparel uh, <laughs> for quite a few yeah. years. So. We started our online business in 2008, and uh, we just put a, you know, that's kind of where I live is I put my heart and soul into both fishing and then that online store. And uh, we we have a cool riverfront location uh, and such here, but um, you know we're we're a great kind of end user group. I'm looking at one of my favorite runs on the river right now um, to fish, uh, and we get to ship. I mean, FedEx picks up here every day, man. We get to run kind of a, you know, this whole. You know, global economy is yeah. pretty cool when you can run a worldwide shipping business from the shore of a river right here where we're at. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of, that's our story. You know, the online business really became what we're, you know, well known for, but we have a really cool location here and, you know, it's taken 20 years, you know, it's like pushing a giant rock up the hill, you know, inch by inch. And, you know, I never thought it, you know, in, you know, working, you know, outfitting is my complete career, but, you know, uh, you know, God moves in mysterious ways. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> here I am on the podcast chatting about fishing and able to do this for a job, man. I'm really blessed. I know it is cool. The original founders of the show who were, who were those uh, people, or uh, the original yeah, founders so, of the shop? Y- yeah, the 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 other managing partner um, that that helped bring me in was Steve Joyce. Um, he is uh, he's originally from Montana, moved out to Seattle, tried his hand at you know, the corporate life in Seattle <laughs> got a little, got a little burned out on that right away. And then, uh, you know, this opportunity at Reds, you know, he and, uh, his uncle Tony and, uh, another partner named Richard, uh, visioneered, uh, you know, what Reds was going to look like. And, you know, Steve is kind of boots on the ground driving force behind this. And, uh, he and I had become fast friends and yeah, he's, uh, you know, he sits next to me and guides next to me every day. And Steve's, you know, he was really kind of that, like I said, boots on the ground, founding partner of the company. And, uh, yeah, Steve's just such an awesome dude. He's fished all over the world, wealth and knowledge. And, uh, yeah, a guy like me couldn't ask for a better partner in this business, uh, which you need. The fly fishing business is tough and you, you got to have those, you know, good people around you. Yep. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, I mean, you have, so I think we have a little background on the story, uh, your story, the red story. And, and I mean, you, now you have a lot going on. You've got, You've got a podcast, The Men. You've got a, a big YouTube channel. You've got, I mean, obviously you've been putting in a lot of energy into the online business, which is, which has been, sounds like doing very well. Um, I mean, you know, we're not going to be able to jump into all of it today, but I did want to, you know, t- maybe talk a little about dry flies and focus on, you know, a little bit on the Yakima and maybe some winter time, winter, spring time fishing. And I don't know, when you, when you hear the, the, the word technical dry fly fishing, does that ring a bell to you? And is that something you guys focus on or talk about up there on the, on the Yakima? Oh, dude, that gets my blood pumping tougher the <laughs> better. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, you know, I've been fortunate if I fished all over the world, uh, for trout and, um, uh, it, you know, nothing gets me more excited than the challenge of technical dry fly fishing. Uh, I absolutely love it. I think it's the heart and soul of the sport. I think that challenge, I think people relish it more than they think. Um, you know, like, more, you know, just this observation that I have is I watched, you know, lots of guided trips come through our company and it seems like people's, you know, their satisfaction and, and just overall enthusiasm, enthusiasm level is so much higher when they get an opportunity to cast at feeding fish, especially challenging feeding fish, you know, it's, it's one of the lures of, of fly fishing in general. It was never easy for us when any of us got started, but dry fly fishing, you know, is, uh, 
I think when people kind of pry into the sport, they it sounds easy in theory. They're like, oh, great. It's just a single fly on the end of the line. I can't tangle that up, right? Hmm. That must be the easy way to go. And, you know, when I get really good, then I can throw a bobber. And, you know, I'll just use, forgive me, Dave, for the, yep. using the term bobber. But oh, yeah. It's a bobber. Uh, George Daniels would call it a suspender, <laughs> which is like, yeah, kind of like mid-range uh, sophisticated, right? <laughs> um, that's type two sophistication. Uh, you know, suspender or bobber, you know, but people kind of go into fly fishing thinking, oh, when I get really good at it, then I'll, you know, streamer fish and then I'll it strike indicator fish or all Euro nymph. And it's like, no, when you get really good at it, you'll spend more of your time dry fly fishing. You know, when that, when the, obviously when those opportunities exist, we don't need to be, you know, a, 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 a devout, um, devoutly neurotic about when and how we're going to fish nothing but dry flies all the time. But yep. a lot of times dry fly fishing is better than you think. You know, I think that mm-hmm. that really is something I want to sink in for people because what I witness a lot of, you know, for people who don't know me or my background, I do a lot of clinics. I do a lot of teaching in like a fish along format side by side where it's not a guided trip. I'm not there to just tie your fly on and tell you what to do. I'm there to mentor you, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, like a coach, you know, mm-hmm. rather than just a guide where I'm there exclusively for hospitality and a nice lunch, you know, and, and free flies. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I do a lot of coaching side by side with anglers and we try it. We call it a fish along. And we, we're, we're there to work hard and be at your service, but we're not there to spoon feed anybody any trout. So. My background is I do a lot of fish alongs um, and uh, do a lot of teaching. I do, do a lot of guiding as well, of course. But, uh, you know, generally what I see is people will, they they like, they fancy the idea of dry fly fishing, but they stick with it for about 45 minutes. And then, then they're, they're tying, it starts with tying a dropper on. Oh, let's just see what the dropper's mm-hmm. like. And then pretty soon they got a, a, a small indicator on. And then pretty soon they're nymphing six feet deep with two nymphs and a shot. Yep. You know, it's like slippery slope right yeah and what happens is most anglers and say this so that everybody listens closely most anglers don't dry fly long enough when the fishing's tough to ever get good at it and so they they constantly they dabble on it for an hour here an hour there and it's like no if you really want to get good at it you probably should just fish dry flies like for a whole day yeah Nothing but dry flies, you know, like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to dry fly fish today and I'm going to learn to make them eat it. I'm going to make that fly look so delectable and so obvious that it's food. Um, there are all sorts of advantages when you go to dry fly fishing that you can stack in your favor. And one is you've got the whole water column covered from one spot, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, as far as covering water and searching dry fly fishing can be incredibly effective. The, the second one is if you're doing it right, you're not polluting the water nearly as much right so i can take a little bite of a piece of water especially on small water you know you know any type of creek or small stream you say say narrower than a city street you know what you know polluting your water is is really a detrimental to your success you know you throw a a strike indicator and an infant you know your your best run and you snag bottom and you rip that line tight and it makes a bunch of noise and that indicator rips tight and it makes a bunch of noise man you've just tainted that spot yeah. whereas like a lot of times you can slip in there with the dry fly fishing and you can take a few slices of that and uh without polluting the water and it's really shocking what you can uncover especially when your fly selection's creative and you're delicate and uh also you know from a technical standpoint you know i i, I didn't believe this 10 years ago i believed it a little bit five years ago i'm absolutely a believer in it today and when it comes to dry fly fishing, I believe the fish seeing that fly land is instrumental in becoming a, a really good and deadly dry fly fisherman. Yeah, I've just I've watched hundreds of thousands of fish eat dry flies. You know, on this river, twenty years of guiding on the river I'm looking at right now, hmm. and uh, when you know it's like you know this joke about shadow casting, right? So like, and maybe a lot of listeners don't really follow this, but a river runs through it. You know, there's you know. Paul McLean is, you know, mastered this thing called shadow casting, cast mm-hmm. low enough and long enough or whatever <laughs> to make a rainbow rise right. for the fly, the, for the fly that's in the air. And it's like, oh, that's such bullshit. Right. You know, and, you know, for the longest time, I always kind of joked about that. But like in guiding, you know, you you have anglers with you. And a lot of times our anglers are very, you know, their skill sets are very novice to intermediate. And uh, 
you know, in guiding, you get in this rut of like, okay, slap the fly in, give it a mend, and then let's float this thing for a long ways. Oh, yeah. Minimal casting, no false casting. Yep. Leave the fly in the water. And, um, you know, I just, after 20 years of watching that, you know, like I'm not some washed up crusty old guy that got burned out 10 years ago, man. I love what I do. I'm still passionate about it. I'm lucky. I got, I get to do other stuff in my dot job. I don't just row a boat. So when I'm on the water, I'm paying attention. I like that game. You know, I'm still, I'm still in the game, I think. And, uh, when I watch anglers that can set the fly down within range of the fish's vision, meaning that fly lands delicately on the water and it creates a ring, you yep. know, or an effect that that fly either one, it did one of two things, either it landed in or on the water. I guess it'd be three things if it fell in the water, if we're talking about a terrestrial. So either it fell in the water, it landed on the water, which caddis and mayflies do all the time. Stonefly, female stoneflies do it as well to lay eggs. So those, those bugs will land on the water, lay their eggs. So either one, it landed on the water to lay their eggs to, I guess I said it fell in the water. And then three is either it's struggling to take off as an emerger, right? Yeah. So a nymph is, you know, stuck in that surface tension. It's kind of jammed in the hydrogen bonds. It's climbing out of the water. And, it's, and what it's going to do is it's going to create a disturbance on the water and make those rings. And, uh, you know, like, you know, if, if anybody's listening can picture themselves out on the end of a dock on a gla- on a lake like on a glassy evening you can look all over that lake and you can see all those little rings from the bugs taking off right you can see them from 50 feet away a lot of the time if it's glassy out well those fish are very perceptive they still see those rings even on a, a slightly choppy river they look at that chop all day so those rings are not something that you you have a pretty tough time imitating them on anything but when the fly lands because when that fly lands especially with the weight of the hook even a dry a light dry fly has hook weight in it if you can delicately set that fly down you're going to create this this kind of this ripple effect or rings coming off that dry fly and when when anglers start to get to that level where they're like okay one i i can read water well enough to know that in that chop line right there i see some standing chop and standing chop is where water's coming downstream and it's hitting something and the water's just kind of standing up and creating some standing chop and the water's not faster. It's just, there's some standing chop. So like one, the angler's like really acute, has really acute river vision, right? So you can see a trout, essentially see the trout in the water more or less when you have a really experienced eye for it. You're like, yeah, there's a trout right there. This is, it's as good as seeing the fish. More on that yeah. later in the podcast. We'll talk, we'll talk about that, but an acute angler is going to say, hey, I know there's a trout there. I'm not going to drift my fly in from 20 feet upstream, e- even though that's kind of this common paradigm of even more advanced anglers think, oh, let's just drift it in from way above. I've got a big reach cast and a long leader. You know, I've got this light line. I'm a very technical angler, you know, to use that term. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can drift it in from 20 feet. You won't be able to sell that fly to a selective trout. But when you drop that fly three or four feet upstream or a foot upstream and you can land it so perfect that it goes pink and it makes that like a, just the subtlest sound. It makes a little set of circular rings come off it. That looks real. And that's, you know, when, when anglers get to that point where they can drop flies on fish like that, the dry fly fishing is a lot better and yeah. more effective than people think, you know, Sweet. like. I, I barely scratched the surface 10 years ago, man. I like, I'm figuring I'm like just sheer observation, no emotional attachment to people's cast. Not my opinion. Watching two anglers fish over the years, side by side, my boat, when you can drop that fly, I don't care if it's a bluing olive or a summer stone fly, when you can drop it on that fish, just right, man, you can sell it and you can, you can, you can yank fish out of spots that, every other angler that's getting 60 foot drifts or 20 foot drifts or whatever it is and they're throwing three bends into it or not getting if you have to mend it you know the, yeah the root of the term mend is to fix or repair something like let's learn to throw casts that you don't need to fix or nor repair because the trout will see it the trout will hear it they'll hear that line move and the trout even even on any one of your home waters man those trout are smarter than you think a big you know mature trout six to seven seasons of, you know, evading anglers getting hooked once in a while, those things get pretty smart. So, you know, I think anglers, you know, kind of to the, 
to the root of what you know you know began this this yeah. segment of the discussion is anglers need to stick with dry fly fishing more if there's people yeah. listening to this are like yeah i want to be like a good dry fly fisherman which is the biggest compliment any fly angler could ever get is you know yeah. like if you talked about joe you'd say man that joe he's a good dry fly fisherman to me that would be like the ultimate compliment you told me i'm a good euro nymph i'd be like okay i'm okay you know thanks <laughs> you know, appreciate yeah. it but i love euro nymphing but yeah. you know dry fly fishing to me is like that's kind of that jedi level you know like there's stuff people we don't even know about dry fly fishing you know like and i hope what some of what i said you know to these listeners understand it go yeah, maybe I'm not quite as good at this as I thought. That's awesome. No, I, I love it. I, I think, you know, I, I had a guy uh, <clears throat> recently this week, I think it was, he, um, I did something on nymp- nipping and um, I mean, he literally said, said an email or said, a, I can't remember, DM or email and said, I'm going to slit my wrist if you talk any more about nymph fishing. You know, I mean, like people, <laughs> people are like hardcore, you know, I mean, he's, he's talking about swinging flies, right? And obviously, you know, we talk a lot about that as well. But, you know, I tend to agree with you. I mean, I think I love everything, you know, and I try to do, do a little bit of everything. But dry fly fishing for me is the hardest thing. You know, I mean, not only tying the flies, you know, you talk about the, the old cat skill style flies, but, but you have all ends of it, right? The casting, you've got to be a great caster to, to plop that thing down and get it within a foot or so, right, of those fish. So if you met like, yeah, just speaking of casting, man, like what people don't get. So here's my analogy. You know, so if you, if you and I were going mule deer hunting, right? So like, let's just say we walk up to a likely Canyon and we think there's a big wily old four by four with, you know, yep. one drop time and double eye guards, right? Like nice. fuck your dream. We walk into that Canyon and you decide, Hey, let's take a couple practice shots and make sure <laughs> my guns are Joe. And I'm like, yeah, Dave, great idea. You fire off a couple of practice shots. And then we walk around the next little rise. And we're like, man, I thought sure that bucket be in here. Man, I guess that guy's gone, you know, like, you know, wonder where he went. It's like, man, you dry fly fish and your fly is an ambush, right? Like this is a trap we're setting for the trout, right? How many times you want to show the trap to the trout? Yeah. It's like, well, the answer is one, man. Like just show it to them once. And if you can read the river really well to where you know where your first cast should go and you can hit paper plate size spots at 25 feet, you don't need to cast 80 feet. Yep. You're going to be light years ahead. Um, when you take this one shot mentality, you know, this delicacy and then taking it, there's lots of things, you know, yeah. I can teach, but taking a deep breath between casts instead of just rapid fire yep. one after another, after another, exactly. um, uh, yeah, observing. learn to false cast. Yeah. And learning to false cast really well. That's one thing that, you know, a lot of co, you know, fly cast and, you know, fly fishing coaches, I shouldn't say fly casting coach, but like you know, guides and fly fishing coaches and and mentors. When I say coaches, I'm not talking just about paid people. I'm talking about you taking your kids or your brother-in-law or your cousin or that guy at work that's been dying to go or your girlfriend or whatever. The, you know, people are like, oh, keep the fly in the water at all times. Fly false casting is the enemy. And it's like, no, man, false casting is you take several seconds to build energy, line speed, and accuracy and control, you know, so that that fly is going exactly where you want it. And it's really good to take a deep breath and take a few extra seconds and use those shots wisely. Cause man, those trout are smart, dude. They, awesome. they, that bug is a rare and unique opportunity. It doesn't come down the lane every three or four seconds unless you're in a, no. you know, blizzard hatch. No. Make your and pass. That's the, no. make, make them count. No, that's good. I, I love where you've, uh, you know, I mean, obviously we're trying to dig into dry flies. You did a good little summary on why and what it takes to be a good dry fly fisherman. Um, like I said, something that's hard for me. If we take it to more down to the rivers and maybe focus on, you know, mayflies. I, I've had a couple of entomologists on the show and we've talked about different bugs and things like that. But, you know, it's interesting. If you take the time of year, you know, now it's we're going into like the new year. Uh, I mean, what's going on with mayflies? Is, is the blue winged olive kind of the the only game in town for the next few months? Or, or we'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so most places in the country uh, during the winter months, you're gonna you're primarily gonna see midge hatches. You know, with the with the exception of spring creeks, which have a you know more controlled water temperature, and you may see really little blue winged olives, which are part of the betis family. Uh, for, for us here, you know, I think we represent 
probably the, a similar calendar, you know, hatch calendar to most streams. Somewhere on this 75 miles river that we're, you know, I'm anchored on right now, there's going to be a blueing olive hatch. It's probably going to be the first mayfly hatch of the year. And, uh, you know, a couple of cool things about the blueing olive is one, they're, they're, they're really similar throughout the entire country. So fly selection becomes really quite simple. It's not like there's a, a blueing olive nymph or merger dry fly specifically that works great here, but doesn't work well elsewhere. Uh, so it's a pretty common insect, uh, but what is probably most intriguing, and I, I know you've had some entomologists on that know mm-hmm. far more about insects and uh, kind of the life cycle of insects than I do, but what I observe with blue-winged olives is it seems to me that when when those nymphs, you know, are, are essentially floating up at the surface and they begin this this I guess they're secondary, I'll say metamorphosis, although that may not be the right term, yep. but they're beginning this this emergence uh, in that surface tension, is the blue-winged olive seems to be a really slow developer. And uh, so, you know, a mayfly is more vulnerable than a caddis in the mm. sense that it takes longer for that fly to fly away, essentially, once it gets up on top of the surface yep. tension. So. When they when they begin eating those duns, they're very gentle and very deliberate and patient rises. There, these trout are going to be, um, especially early in the year, Dave. A lot of times, these water temperatures might only be in the, you know, mid to upper 40s. Um, you know, as low as four, you know, 44 ish. You know, something like that. A lot of times, those fish are going to be holding in the very back ends, in the tail outs of a lot of these pools and it's one of the few hatches or a few times where at least the trout here will, will back out of the heads and out of the real unique, you know, seam lines and foam lines, <clears throat> they'll actually back up into the tail out because what happens in the tail out is <clears throat> that water column, you know, goes from very deep where it might be say six feet deep in a pool and squeezes it down to about, you know, anywhere from, 18 to 36 inches or 12 inches, whatever the depth of the back end of it is. And so those nymphs get squeezed right to the surface and it helps their emergence. And then they tend to hit the, uh, the surface right there in the tail out and those fish will back out into the tail out. And, uh, you'll get these very gentle, very patient yawning type rises on blue golf hatches. And it's just mesmerizing to watch these trout, especially when they're in tail outs because their behavior is so cool, man. They'll they'll actually wander left and right. They'll follow foam lines. They'll track individual bugs. Um, and those fish will wander back and forth. And when they move on to eating duns, they'll have that real like mouth open, you know, upper lip, you know, exposed out of the water you know, fly gently floating in. And then you see that, that, that set of big yapper jaws just close right on that little tiny blue and golem. Uh, when you start to see feeding action like that, that's very special. And, uh, you don't see that with caddis and you don't see that with stoneflies, but man, little mayflies, when they get on those duns, they tend to eat those things very deliberately. And, uh, you want to be ready for that as well. Uh, a lot, a lot of mayfly hatches in general are going to be pretty short-lived, especially in the spring when we have very, you know, tumultuous water conditions, right? It's very different than the fall. The fall, it's like, hey, it's, we get warm days, we get cold nights, even in October, the weather's pretty predictable. We're not getting a lot of rain. We're not getting a lot of snow. But man, in March, April, May, early June, we've got, you know, the heat is going to affect snowmelt. We've got rainstorms. We've got pressure changes we got all this different junk happening and um if you if you're seeing a mayfly hatch starting especially in the springtime you want to make sure that you've got you know the right rod and right real line leader set up you know something that's a pretty purpose-built tool for the hatch if you want to take full advantage of it and just be ready because they the hatch or the the hatch can last you know several hours but that feeding window for those duns which is really what you want to be on is going to be, uh, can be pretty short lived. It can be 20, 30, 40 minutes at times. Gotcha. Okay. Then that clarifies a little bit. Then 
And I guess, what, is there a time, a window when you'd say if we did focus on blue winged olives, it's it's best, um, you know, during the winter or spring or, or what, do you guys fish it or do you just kind of always have them ready for that hatch to, when, when the conditions are right? Yeah, as far as a real specific calendar, you know, here, uh, you know, we're about the third week of March on the early end and early May on the back end for the blue winged olive hatch, you know, specifically. Uh, we do get other mayfly hatches during that time. The March brown hatch is just standing. You know, that's a great hatch. Um, it's a bigger insect on average. You know, March browns are a common name, not a scientific name. Same with blue winged olive. You know, the scientific name is a, it's a, in the betas family of blue winged olive. But you can use blue winged olive. They could be a, a size 24 in a certain hatch, a certain place. They could be a size 14. Oh, wow. Rarely, I mean, not very commonly a 14, but they could be a 14, you know, there's, there's betas that can be as big as that on other rivers. So, yep. um, arch browns here in, in like a lot of places are, are typically, uh, that term is used and I can't remember, you know, I'm not going to speak any Latin, I promise, <laughs> in the word betas, but yeah, betas. Uh, I can't remember what family, uh, you know, March browns are specifically a part of, but they're a much larger bug. And, uh, that's very common, uh, for us at the very end of March, more so that first week of April. Uh, and then through most of April, we see March Browns. And I think that, cl- that, that clock is going to be pretty similar. That calendar is going to be pretty similar for most other places in the country. Uh, but the blue winged olives typically will be, uh, the first hatch for, for us here in the, the Northwest. So, yeah. So basically that, that you, you clarified there, the March, um, you know, you've got a couple. Yeah. I mean, you've got the March Browns, the blue winged olives are big in that uh, March in that spring period. And then, and you mentioned the gear. Can you just talk briefly about if you're just talking just dry fly fishing, I guess maybe more in general, uh, what do people need to talk, talk about kind of all the gear, not only rod, reel, line, um, but other gear we might need to think about if you're kind of brand new to the dry fly game? Yeah. If you're brand new to the dry fly game, the number one thing that you need to have is just a little work ethic and patience. Like, you know, we're going to talk about gear, but, you know, something I said earlier is if you want to be good at dry fly fishing, you have to dry fly fish when it's tough. Like you, you've got to just fish through it. You've got to get good at it. You have to get good at the casting and I'll share a little story. I promise I'll talk about gear, but I want to share just a little story here. So early in my guide career, I guided these two, these two guys, you know, I, at the time I considered them older, you know, they were probably like 50. No, no I'm kidding. <laughs> they, were, they were in their seventies. And, uh, I guided these guys uh, quite a bit. Um, they took a liking to me, even though I was kind of a young and experienced guide. Um, you know, they, they took a liking to my spirit, I suppose. And so they, they, they enjoyed fishing with me when they would come out and, uh, they were very, uh, they were very devout and distinguished dry fly anglers. They're very good at it. And I consider these guys mentors. And um, I consider a lot of my guests, my guided guests, are mentors of mine because I watch them fish, I learn from them, and everybody has something to share, even if they're very inexperienced. Um, Everybody has something to teach you. And uh, I was the professional, but I'm learning from these guys. And I could take those guys, their names are Bill and Doug. And um, I could take Bill and Doug out, and they could fish number 18 pair of atoms in heavy swift water and they could see their fly and they could keep their fly floating while I rode the boat and they could drop little number 18 parachute atoms on seam lines and catch fish out of heavy rapid water and they could see their fly just fine. And I guided those guys doing that one day and I, I was like, wow, that was great. You know, we, we did good fishing, but I didn't really think about the how or the why or et cetera at the time. But I think it was like I had a trip. I'm trying to, it's, my memory's a little foggy here, but I had a trip the next day and I tried to do the same thing, even with some pretty good fishermen. And they were much younger. Um, you know, they should have had young eyes. You know, they're in their 30s or 40s, kind of in their prime, and they could not see their fly to save their life. I mean, they couldn't see a number 14 pair of atoms. And uh, I thought about it. I'm like, why could Bill and Doug see their fly so good? And it's like, man, that's because these guys are seasoned anglers, man. They can drop, they can, that, that pair of atoms hits exactly where they're looking. And so they could hit, they could put it on up. And if they're looking at the teacup, then a little number 18 atoms shows up in the middle of the teacup and the, the fly stays on the surface because they don't need to, they don't need to mend it. They don't need to adjust it and fix it and repair the drift all the time. 
they would just pick it up, false cast a couple of times, drop it in again. They're keeping that little fly very buoyant. So your, your ability your ability to do these things really pivots on your ability to cast well and have some dry fly experience. And uh, I've never forgot that. That was almost 20 years ago. And dry fly anglers that are very good at it, they can see even the smallest, tiniest flies because the fly hits exactly where they're looking. And uh, they don't need to mend it a lot, so therefore they can keep it on the surface. So regarding gear, you can dive into becoming a good dry fly fisherman with pretty much any standard weight forward floating line and any type of reasonable rod that's set up well. Um, anglers, you know, can adapt very well. Dry fly fishing is your, your success is going to pivot much more largely on your experience level. Now, when it comes to something like Euro nymphing, the tackle makes an enormous difference. Dry fly fishing, it becomes, you know, an advantage. Um, so I, w- I want to be fair in saying there's certain disciplines that it makes a huge difference in dry fly fishing. Just get a good flexible rod, you know, medium fast action is generally going to be better for dry fly fishing on average. If I had to pick one rod for just, you know, Western style dry fly fishing for this kind of the spot and stock type mayfly fishing, it would be a three weight in that eight and a half to nine foot range. You know, probably that, that length would pivot a little bit based on what size water I'm targeting most of the time. Maybe a four weight that's eight and a half or nine feet long if I'm on a big, you know, windy river, um, big kind of windy open river back east, maybe I'm going eight feet. Um, but lighter lines are, are inherently better for dry fly fishing. They have a, the, the line itself has a much smaller uh, cross-sectional diameter. You get less drag out of a three-weight line than you do a five-weight line. Just straight up, just less drag. Most drag in a drift comes from the fly line, not the leader. Okay. So I'm, I'm running a light line. Um, and it's, it's probably going to be a medium to medium fast action rod you know, like a Sage Trout LL or a Winston Pure, if we're talking about like today's, you know, uh, models uh, or the two rods that that I like to fish quite a bit for dry fly specific work. Uh, And I'm going to have a leader that's, um, I I didn't used to, I I just laugh at some of the, like these, I don't know where you come to these conclusions in your life. I'm 41 years old and I just laugh at some of the stupid stuff that I used to think or these opinions that I had. (laughs) Yeah. I used to think tapered leaders were exclusively for rich people and clients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's like a good tapered leader, like a nice fresh tapered leader, it makes your dry fly fishing better. Yeah. So tapered leaders in general, they're going to, you know, I would strongly encourage people to get several d- different versions, weights, you know, and they should be kind of appropriately matched to the hatch or the water size uh, that you're on or um, maybe the, the atmospheric conditions, right? So like if it's windy, and you're throwing a green drake, uh, that's going to be very different than being out on a really glassy section of the, the Missouri River throwing trichos. Totally, totally different needs. So get some taper leaders. Don't be cheap. Just get them. Put them in your tackle bag. You don't actually pay for this resource. It's kind of like a fly. Like people wince, like buying flies. Like, man, you should wince when you're losing flies, yeah. you know, out on the river. Not when you're buying them. Buying them is fun, man. That's an investment. You know, buy good flies. Taper leaders are the same thing. I used to, man, I just laugh, you know. Again, like, I don't know why I thought hand tie leaders were so great. You know, when, when you have a knotless leader, it slides through the water better. It tends to turn over better. It's more predictable. And I get less tangles, right? So, like, and... Yep. You know, you know, for people listening, like, oh man, who's the podcaster? He gets tangled when he casts. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. man, I, I push, I'll push the envelope on loop tightness, man. If I got to hit a spot at forty feet and a slight crosswind, you can, yeah, you can bet I'm going to push the envelope. I'm going to try to throw a razor tight loop, you know, where I'm stacking that leader on top of that fly line, and my loop might be twelve inches, you know, in height. Yeah, I'm going to tail that thing up once in a while. And the more binding points you have in those leaders, like hand-tied leaders, I used to hand-tie them, and there might be six sections in them. And those blood knots or surgeon's knots, double nails, double unis, whatever I'm using to splice it up, oh, there's a bunch of catch points in there. Your time's too valuable. Stop wasting time. Get tapered leaders anywhere from 12 foot, you know, on the 5X end. You know, I generally don't buy a tapered leader that's going to go down to six. 
you know, I'll splice into it if I need a piece, a chunk of six or a chunk of seven. Uh, but get everything from seven and a half feet. The Rio supple flex tippets are great. They're specifically purpose built for dry fly fishing. They're more flexible in nature and they're thinner in the butt section, the middle section. So that cross sectional drag of these current seams or these rip tides pushing on your lead, your tapered leader, that, that supple flex leader is thinner. It still turns over a dry fly fine, but the same leader or the same butt section that's required to you know, lob two stonefly nymphs and a bob or a chunk of split shot. You don't need that same leader to to throw a number, you know, number 16 missing link caddis pattern, you know, you, you two totally different leaders. So you spent, you know, whatever you spent on the rod, your time is value, but you've got a good fly line. You know, the leader system itself is, is quite critical in general. You know, if you're fishing anything that's size 18 to 22 ish, you know, that little itty bitty stuff, you're going to want six and seven X tippet in my, yep. you, you can get away with five, you know, but last fall, I think it was fall before last, I used to scoff and kind of thumb my nose, the idea of using seven X tippet. And there's a dude, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to have him on the podcast sometime. I, I want to talk to this guy, you know, a couple of times, but his name is Jason Levers. Um, he, he runs a fly tying materials business called nymph master. And I was just, I was BS with Jason on the phone one day and he was kind of newer to fishing this river. And this was a Euro nymphing scenario, but I took some, a little tidbit of what I picked up from him and I applied it to dry fly fishing immediately after I talked to him because I was going out on a guide trip like the next day, Jason was telling me, he's like, Oh, I switched from six X to seven X. I downsized on that river and it doubled the number of strikes I got. Hmm. And I'm like, man, I'm like, even if that's BS, like I didn't think it was, you know, but I'm like, even if it was, that's usually my bullshit filter is like, even if it is BS, part of it is true. And therefore I'm going to try it. So he was saying seven X tip, it doubled his hookups. I'm like, man, could it be? So I was out on a bluing golf hatch that was in the fall. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to run seven on my dry fly fishing. And I'm going to run like two feet of seven X and give it more flexibility. Dave, the difference was like night and day. Nice. The, fi- the fish's willingness to take on that lighter line. Yep. So it just adds so much more flexibility and that, that thinner diameter just reduces drag. And that same principle is true in the body section of your tapered leaders out to your tippet. Yeah. So yeah. Gotcha. It, on that smaller stuff, you know, taper down to five X or six X. And then if you're having trouble catching these fish, which I was having trouble catching these fish on these blue wings at that time, uh, then you can, you can extend it out to seven X. Um, yeah. But I think leaders should range for very large river scenarios like the, you know, the, the Missouri River where, you know, you're fishing big, open, slick water with a lot of complex currents. 12-foot leaders are great for tight, you know, scenarios where you might have a little bit of wind or you, you're throwing a green drake or a March Brown or something larger. Something like a 7.5-foot 4X leader is very appropriate for that, mm-hmm. uh, especially if you're doing a lot of roll casting, um, you know roll casts are more accurate with shorter leaders. Um, you can still roll cast plenty with longer leaders, but you're going to get a lot of, uh, yeah, you're, that, that tippet and that fly are going to wander a lot. Yep. Um, so, you know, get a couple of different leaders and be prepared to adjust accordingly based on hatch and environment. Gotcha. So, so if you did that, so you're out there and, you know, like you're saying the 12 X and you mentioned the Rio, uh, flex tippets. Um, and are those the, is that the Rio, is that a full built leader? You can just get your, um, custom or a leader from Rio. Is that, was that the one you mentioned? Yeah, they make both. They make a, you know, full blown tapered leader. It's a supple flux. You know, we, we sell a, a, a litany of them, but having a few dry fly specific leaders, uh, I think is really a big advantage. I think it takes a game that's tough and gives you somewhat of a, yeah an, an advantage, uh, in getting that drift. And then they do make supple flex tippet as well. Gotcha. Uh, I'm not as picky about the tippet. I think that there's a limit on the amount of tippet, you know, that, you know, somebody can use. I, I tend to use standard mono, you know, mono <laughs> tippet. I don't use a dry fly specific tippet gotcha. uh, for my dry fly. Okay. Fishing. So basically, and that's, so if you could be, it sounds like, yeah, 12 foot, maybe, uh, a five, six or seven X. And then on the seven X, I mean, I guess if you're dealing with bigger fish, is there any time where you might want to think maybe you're breaking too many fish off or is that not a problem? No, you know, a lighter weight rod is going to help with that tremendously. Right. So like 
when you go back to that, you know, my recommendation on, I want a three weight rod for most, you know, a nine foot or eight and a half foot, a longer three weight rod for most of my dry fly fishing, where I'm going to encounter trout anywhere from say 10 to 20 inches, you know, um, you get beyond the 20 inches. That's kind of the Holy grail. Um, yeah. a little bit more of an anomaly. I, I yep. think most of our, our target range, you know, let's realistically, you know, we're going to be somewhere around, you know, 13 to 16 inches a lot of the time, um, most trout streams. Um, those lighter rods protect that light tippet. Um, they set the hook better, and they tend to keep fish pinned on these lightweight, flexible dry fly hooks a lot better than, say, your four, five, six-weight rods. Yeah. Hooks flex. You don't believe me? Just put them in a vise yep. and, and try wrap and thread on them, man. Mm-hmm. You're going to see that hook wander all over the place. And it's spring steel, or it, you know, it's type of spring steel. It just, it bends back, it bounces back. But what you'll have is you'll have fish that go on a run, they jump, they do different stuff, and that 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 hook flexes a little bit, gets the fish comes off. You bring your hook in, the hook looks fine, but you're testing the flexibility of that hook. So lighter tippets have stretch, and lighter rods, um, lighter rods help absorb a lot of that those. You know those accelerations and those jumps and initial hookups. So, lighter rods are really useful in that sense. And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. What's worse than a day with no bites? A day without coffee, or even worse, a day with bad coffee. Thankfully, that isn't the case for us. With more than forty years of experience in coffee, the Anglers Coffee Team roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. That's why they've released a brand new coffee subscription program made just for you. Just visit anglerscoffee.com, provide your coffee preferences, your mailing address, and how much coffee you drink in a week, and they'll take care of the rest. There's no obligations or hidden fees, just great coffee delivered to your front door. And I've been using and loving Angler's Coffee, and I am a coffee fanatic and have tasted a uh, bad coffee for sure. Angler's Coffee is definitely great coffee. I've been enjoying it. Um, it's as good, to be honest with you, it's as good as, as I've had <laughs> that I could remember. And that's pretty awesome saying uh, since I drink a lot of coffee. So uh, join me in supporting a great company who supports great coffee, fly fishing, and conservation. As part of Angler's Conservation Alliance, Angler's Coffee donates a portion of every sale to help conserve and protect our wild natural habitats and fish species. Right now, they're raising money for Soul River, which brings veterans and inner city youth out into the river to teach conservation, fishing skills, and more. Right now, you can get 20% off your first subscription box or gift box. Simply use the code WETFLYSWING at checkout. Just visit anglerscoffee.com and get 20% off your first subscription or gift box using Wet Fly Swing at checkout. That's anglerscoffee.com. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. To be honest, I have never been a huge net guy, mainly because I didn't feel like my uh, old collapsible net was easiest to use and was not easy on the eye, if you know what I mean. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. For Ethan, the founder of Stonefly Nets, fly fishing has always had a traditional feel going back to fishing the three-weight bamboo rod with his great-grandmother. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create amazing lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y to get started right now. And then I guess going back and just if we're, if somebody was there, like right now, they're going to go over to your online store and grab something. Let's say they, they were in the, if we're talking, you know, money, I mean, they had say under $500, they wanted to get a, a rod, reel, line set up. What, um, you know, what would they need to know or what, what would you recommend they, they grab? You know, I always recommend, you know, if you can, if you can get something U.S. built, 
Um, I, I just, I think those rods have more staying power for people. So I'd probably start with like a Sage foundation rod. It's a great medium fast action rod, better than it should be for 325 bucks or whatever okay. it is. Um, regarding reels, reels are much less critical. They just need to be reliable and you need to enjoy the swing weight, like reels that are too heavy yeah. are just cumbersome and it's just not as enjoyable to learn casting. And if you don't enjoy, you know, if you don't enjoy casting or people don't enjoy the act of false casting, they're not going to stick with fly fishing long enough to get good at it and then generate the type of success they're dreaming about. So like Sage foundation. And then there's, there's a, there's a hundred dollar click and Paul reel called the red ink zero. That's a great choice. And then, uh -huh. You know, a fly line at a hundred bucks, you know, I really like the scientific anglers, um, amplitude smooth series. Yep. I just think those lines are they're very durable. They're slick. They shoot good. They're easy to cast. Um, Perfect. yeah, I think somebody gets set up with gear. They can be proud of for a long time and yep. man, any of the gear, uh -oh. yeah. you know, just to listeners, like don't get caught up in this, you know, you can't buy a, you can't buy yourself a fly cast. <laughs> You know, we sell really nice gear at Reds because we want to see, you know, we, you know, we, we tend generally cater to customers that want to commit to fly fishing for a long term, but there are $80 rods that are fine. I mean, there's some echo, you know, this yeah. echo long, um, lift, I think is their new one. The echo lift is better than it should be for the price. And if you can get a Reddington classic trout, you know, they've been really hard to get as of lately, by the time people listen to this, they're probably in stock. It's like a hundred and fifty or hundred and sixty dollar rod. I can't remember exactly yeah. what it retails at. That rod is really tough to beat. I, you know, whatever you can get, get. Don't you know? Don't let finances create any type of barrier for you to get into fly fishing. And anybody who tells you otherwise is they're working against you. Yeah. And so don't believe them. That's a great tip. All this gear is going to work fine. The better gear is going to have more staying power. You're going to be much less likely to buy it twice. Gotcha. Okay. And, and so basically we have the rod reel line. We talked about the leader and then what other, if you know, again, somebody's going out to the Yakima, they're planning a trip for say March. Um, and they got all that. What other dry fly, you know, I mean like fly float and anything else. I mean, just the, can you break down just like the top, you know, 10 or 15 things or whatever it is that some, I, I know you could probably go with just that, but is there anything additional you would add there? Yeah, dude, you're talking about the Bear Grylls Dry Fly Survival Pack. Oh, that, there, yeah, exactly, right? exactly. That's it. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll call it the Joe Rotor. Uh, yeah, Dry Fly Survival Pack. This is it. Um, so, yeah, the uh, you know, I would say you know, get three or four liters. Those are cheap, you know, and they 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 have a tangible impact on your ability to fish um, correctly. Okay, um, for especially if people are newer or don't like knots. Putting a fresh tapered leader on, your time is very valuable. Putting a fresh tapered leader on at the beginning of a trip is really critical because if you break off a fly, chances are it broke right at the fly. And you're not now you don't have to be tying a piece of tippet on while you're standing thigh deep in rushing water out yep. in the middle of the river. So four tapered leaders, you're about seven and a half foot, four X for your big stuff, and then a couple of nine nine foot, uh, probably a nine foot five X, a nine foot six X, and uh you know, a, a 12 foot, you know, five X, you know, for really big, open, very slick water environments, or even a lake dry fly fishing scenario where you've got a, you're casting a rising fish on a lake. Uh, so you, you get your rod, you got a floating line, you know, rod should be, you know, I preferably a three or four weight, five way to work fine, whatever gear you got, use it to the best of your ability regarding small tackle items. Uh, naturally, you know, fly selection, I'll, I'll touch on fly selection in just a second, but if somebody has a dozen dry flies that they know how they work, which is critical and they believe in them, which is more critical, a dozen dry flies, or you can fish all over this planet on all sorts of different hatches with a dozen dry flies by creating the illusion that that bug is real and it's sitting on the surface. Kind of like I talked about at the beginning of the podcast creating the illusion that this, this thing that is on the end of your line is in fact real. So a dozen dry flies, standard fly floating, Loon Aquel or Loon Loxaw. We sell, we sell both those at Reds. Those are the most two common floatants. You can use a Flyagra product, which is basically lighter fluid that you dip your fly into. That stuff works great. I don't think it's essential. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are other types of, of, of floating, but I, basic starter pack man you just need a silicone based gel foam like a lunaquil you need some hemostats to 
pinch barbs, remove hooks. They're handy for tying knots. They're going to help you move efficiently. You need a couple of spools of tippet, 4X, 5X, 6X tippet. Leave the 7X for later when you bump into challenges with very picky fish. 3X, generally speaking, unless you're throwing really big wind-resistant hoppers that tend to spin your leader, um, spin it and twist it up. 4X, you know, suffices for pretty much most, you know, 90 plus percent of dry fly fishing. Yeah, get yourself some, you know, good wading shoes, man. Get out there, get your line wet and get in the trench and do some battle and don't get dejected when you're not having as much success as you think you're going to. Because for most people, it's going to take a little while really to get, like I said, truly good at this. Not a self-proclaimed good, (laughs) but the type of good where your buddy says, damn, that Dave, he's a really good dry fly fisherman. That's right. And then Dave's chest swells up a little bit. That's right. Kind of walking around a little different. Yeah, no, I've had plenty of those. And I agree, like you said a while back, you know, focusing. I mean, the salmon fly hatch is the extreme version, but that's the hatch that I'm always, it's always in the back of my mind. And I've gone through phases where I have, it's funny, right? Use nips and stuff, but I pretty much go on that trip and it's like, it's all dry flies. You know, there's nothing else I'm going to fish. Even if the dry flies are off, you can still pick up some fish. And it's, that's probably the way it is, you know, with, with any dry fly fishing, um, it sounds like. So, so that's cool. Um, well, this is good. This is Joe, uh, yeah, Joe, uh, Joe Rotter's, uh, you know, uh, survival pack. We got the the deal here and that gives us a good start i guess i mean you know as we think about kind of slowly wrapping this thing up and and heading out of here you know there's a ton of stuff we're leaving on the table um just wanted i'm taking a look here Uh, dan turner actually from the facebook group actually that's where that gear question came from specifically he was wondering about um you know dry fly fishing what 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 did he need to get started so i'm glad you touched on that another thing this is another big one maybe you just touch on briefly uh, he also asked about um, how to read water, right? And reading water, that's always the tough thing, you know. Is dry fly fishing any different than anything else, or, or are you just looking for where fish are rising? How, how would you uh, answer that question? Yeah, I mean, there's two fundamentally different types of dry fly fishing, right? There's the spot and stock, meaning uh, one, we either see a fish um, in the water, right? That could be underwater, uh, or we see the fish uh, feeding on the surface, right? So. Spot and stock, right, or prospecting or, or blind casting. So um, when it comes to reading water, uh, you, you know, yeah, your, your, your ability to make your first shot. So th- there's so many like these little paradigms that you learn from somebody and then that becomes kind of the standard. And like all of a sudden your fishing is dictated by these little pieces of crappy advice you got really early on in your fly fishing careers. And one of those pieces of crappy advice was oh, always start short and work the close stuff first and then work your way out to the good water. There's a, there's a little bit of value in that, right? Like very, but it's a, there's a little bit of value in it. You know, I, over the years as I've watched, you know, anglers and, and you, you get a very unemotional, especially when you get comfortable in your own skin as a guide and your ego doesn't inflate and deflate every day based on the number of fish you catch. And you get to the point where you're like, you just want to see the people learn and have a nice time. And I know all that sounds like, you know, a bunch of ret- you know, outfitter rhetoric. No, I like really do. You just want to see the people have fun, bring something of value away because you, you plan on having a fishing relationship with this person for many years to come. And so I'm, I don't really care. I don't want to say I don't care, but I, if they screw something up, I don't care as much as I used to. And what happens is when anglers get out and they go to wade a fishing spot, and let's just say they're prospect dry fly casting, and this is how this relates to reading water is this. They inherently walk up and they don't approach a piece of water with their their goal, right? Your goal for approaching any piece of water is to catch like one really nice trout, right? That's just like yep. if we could accomplish that every time we walk in a piece of water, It'd be great. great. It'd be like the four yard rush in the NFL. If you could rush the ball four yards every single time unequivocally, you'd win the Super Bowl every year. Hmm. It's like if if you could catch one trout each time, one decent trout each time you get got out of the boat or or fished over seam, you'd be great. What people do is they either walk over the fish, right? They they walk onto the fish and they start casting out into the middle of the river into the fastest piece of water. Or they, they do what I was describing about that mule deer analogy where they start taking practice shots oh, way yeah. too close. 
And uh, if your goal is to catch nice trout, do so on the very first cast. Go ahead and take the biggest bite that has, makes the least amount of pollution in the pool and catch that fish on the first cast. I promise you, when you approach water with that idea, like I get one shot, I get to I get one first cast in this piece of water. Go ahead and cover as much of it as you can with one cast as you walk into the run. So reading water becomes very critical in looking at that water and going, okay, how can I get most of this with one single drift on my first shot? And when it comes to dry fly fishing, if you just run a drift and then you take a deep breath and you count to three, you've kind of let the pool reset almost because your, your, your influence or your, your impact in that hole should be very, very minimal. So look for any transitions, you know, when it comes to just raw tips, transitions, seam lines, changes, the edges of fast and slow, uh, areas of convergence where surface currents are squeezing together, easily marked by foam lines. If you have any detergents or alkalinity present, you know, you'll get these bubble lines or these foam lines. Mm -hmm. You know, that saying is the foam is home. Yep. It's true. So foam is home. So areas of convergence where those currents are squeezing water together, a trout's in the river 24 hours a day, seven days a week any little advantage that they have in those tides that squeeze and compress food are going to be of value rivers, you know, regarding temperatures and gradients and species and all that kind of changes that it's really hard to, to chat about reading water. But yeah. when you, when you identify a target, cover it with, with one cast first, catch that one fish, smile, take a deep breath, have a sandwich, and then go, then re-engage the hole again after it's quieted down and go at it with the same MO that you're going to cover that piece of water with one cast as best you can. Don't take these tiny little bites. Fish can see, what, 300 degrees around them. So this idea that we're going to take these little bites and work the soft water, and then I'm going to work six inches further out and a foot further out, I think that there's... I think there's a bunch of that as baloney. The fish are going to see that every fly that comes into that pool. The only, the, the one thing I do want you to consider when you, when you look at that is if you're casting at a feeding fish though, if you can get a feeding fish to turn his head towards you, even ever to come get your fly, even ever so slightly. And I'm talking about inches, yeah, inches. That's an advantage because they're not swimming through tippet to potentially bite the fly. So you, you, do, you do want fish to turn toward you to get your fly when you're sight casting it at trout. Um, but that's a very, that's like more kind of like technical kind of ninja level type dry fly fishing. You know, we want that fish to turn its head even two to three, four inches towards you. So that way it's not coming through your tippet and you get a better hookup, you know, your yeah. better, you know, strike to hook up conversion with that little, that little advantage for you. Yeah, that's killer. Uh, so w- one thing I want to talk about yeah. is, uh, is flies. Yeah. We, we really should, uh, well, we'll make sure. sure when we, before we wrap this up, I think fly selection is really critical for people to kind of understand, know, uh, their dry fly selection. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's dig into that because I have a little segment I usually do uh, called the, uh, the two twenty two, which is top two, uh, flies, top two tips, top two resources, but maybe we can just dig into flies as much as you want here. And I mean, we were talking about, obviously we're focusing a little bit on may flies and we're focusing on, you know, blue winged dolls. We talked a little about March Browns, but you know, let's just take us again. We're, we're in that period where we're, we're kind of in that winter spring period. Um, what, what would you be putting on? What do you need in your, to have in your box for mayflies? Yeah. Regarding mayflies specifically, uh, they're not, they're going to hit our web store. Uh, they're a new pattern from Umpqua. They're going to hit our web store in late January. So I think everybody, by the time they listen to this, they're going to be up online, but there's a series of flies, and I believe the tire's name is Antonio Gonzalez. Um, I know his name is Antonio, and he's got a series of these flies that I got as samples this last year. My friend Russell Miller at Umpqua was like, "Dude, you got to have these things, man." They're like, they're they've been fishing these things in competitions, <laughs> and, hmm. and uh, I'd say Antonio's any of the Antonio's Mayfly or Antonio's a Berger series. Uh, I think an angler, if they were trying to simplify fly selection, which I think is really critical, I think anglers need to understand how their flies float, how they should float, so that when they get too soggy, they quickly quickly recognize whether that's normal behavior or that fly needs to be changed. Uh, 
They know the color of the fly. Their, their eye picks it up very quickly. If you can't see your fly, you can't fish your fly. I think familiarity is really important. If I were just picking two patterns, it'd be any of the Antonio's emergers or the Antonio's mayflies. And he's got like a Superman caddis and some other ones. But I'm telling you, Dave, these things get bit, dude. And these are dry flies? These are dry flies, yeah. Even the emerger patterns is going to have a CDC uh, piece of material on the wing that's going to have the kind of the shank of the hook and the body floating slightly subsurface below that surface tension. And then the wing is going to be up on the surface. But, yeah, Antonio's mayfly, man, there are certain flies that just get bit. Mm. Like, they don't – it's a cool-looking fly and all that. But, man, we're trying to sell flies that fish. I mean, ultimately, like there are a lot of flies we bring through reds and it's like a lot of our biggest customers are our guide team. And they're like, ah, dude, these things look cool, but they do not fish. And that pattern's out. Man. We, we get rid of that thing. I don't care how well it sells online. If my guides say it doesn't fish, it's out. But this Antonio's may fly. Dude, the thing floats square. It floats consistently and it mends good, meaning it stays square and upright on the water. Even when you pull tension and mend it, hmm. uh, it, it, it dimples well when you set it on the water. It just tends to set down. You don't fly. I mean, people who are listening to dumb some dry fly fishing, how annoying is it when your parachute atoms lands on its side? Yeah. It's like, it doesn't fish, right? You make the perfect cast. You made the perfect stock. You dropped it right on the trout. It's like, damn, my fly's floating on its side again. <laughs> you, you can't live like that, man. No. But that Antonio's pattern that that cpc on the top man it seems to act as just this really nice kind of this windbreak and it just sends it's it sets down very consistently and very square i got a hold of those last year and it drove me nuts because they were a new pattern and i couldn't get them until uh un, until they're about to land here in the next right week to two weeks so can you describe one of the dry flies that would work say if we were fishing spring winter if you had to pick one to say one of those flies that you would use, maybe yeah, for for that blueing doll of hatch or the or the March Brown. Oh, Antonio's, you know, Mayfly BWO. Oh, okay, he always got one right. He's got a whole series of just BWOs or March Browns. It's all in that in that series, dude. And they're they're simple, man. I mean, they're not like they're not complicated. What does the BWO look like? What what is that BWO? Could you describe what uh, the materials and stuff? Yeah, it's got like a CDC wing, uh, very, uh, very simple, skinny body, but it's gray CDC. And uh, it's it's got like kind of this cosmic, or- there's a little kind of tough, to kind of a cosmic orangish material in there. I, I don't know that it's a CDC. Or I, I don't have one in front of me, unfortunately. I'm going off recollection, but um, it's almost like a Z-Lon or a C. No, it's not Z-Lon because it's, it's pretty buoyant, but... Um, there's just a little tough the orange in there makes it easy to see, but it's that CDC that has these great bubble properties, oh, yeah. and uh, you know it has that that natural uh, kind of phosphorescence and glisten to it that only a bug flapping its wings can really produce outside of CDC. Those microfibers tend to catch light, and I believe there's a lot unknown. I mean, about dry flies in general. And one thing that we don't consider from the human eye looking at a fly is when you backlight that fly with sun or the sky and you bring light through it with water on those wings, the illusion of that insect flapping its wings and moving and creating action is then created. And that material, that hackle or that elk hair or that CDC or that yarn or whatever it is, if it doesn't glisten and put off the right halo of, of kind of this or prism around it, it's not going to fish. It might look great. It might float really well. But, man, there's a huge difference. Like, I love a pair of atoms, and those things work good. But, man, there's some materials out there now and some patterns that just fish. I mean, we just have more knowledge now than we did 20, 30, 40 years ago. And uh, the material itself, we don't – we don't see it the way the trout does. And I know that sounds silly. And that's why some patterns, like I said, and it, the term of like, it just gets bit. Like we don't need a biological or an entomological explanation all the time. We want one, but we don't need one all the time. I'm just telling you, like they're patterns to get bit. And, uh, that's awesome. And, and that term kind of cracks me up because it brings out the kind of the hillbilly in myself, but, yeah. uh, it does. It gets bit. I was watching a, 
I laugh. I use that term because yeah. I was watching a Canadian, a Canadian guy one time tie a fly in a seminar and he was stoked and he had this great Canadian accent, right? <laughs> His dad has this entertaining dialect and he's just, you can see him the, the closer he gets done to getting this little squall pattern. He was tying done. He's just getting himself fired up and he's just talking. And finally he's like, I don't know. I don't have a further explanation. This thing just gets bit. Yeah. And I'm like, straight up dude like yeah that's what you know i what need to know like now i want one of those you know that, that's awesome <laughs> well this has been this has been good uh, i think joe maybe we could just wrap it out here with a, a rapid fire round just to kind of uh get through a few more uh here and then we'll take us out of here and uh the first one if you have time here um so going back to red's fly shop right so i can't remember if we we'd highlight this but who, who was who was red yeah so red was uh red was um, Red was married to the an owner named Marlene Blankenship. She ran Riverview Campground for a, a long time here. Uh, there's a rich history of this unique property here that we have. Uh, Red started Red's Fly Shop, and it was run off the porch of that same single wide trailer that we used to run our fly shop out of. Um, and uh, Red liked tying flies. I think he liked selling them better. Um, you know, Red since passed on. Yeah. But it was run off the porch of the trailer. You didn't actually go inside. You just Hold on up. Maybe you needed a shuttle. Maybe you wanted to rent a raft or do some camping. Huh. And maybe you needed some tippet or some flies or a leader. And uh, yeah, Red would hook you up, man. Um, wow. And he'd un- it was like in a medicine style cabinet, you know, some of the stuff. And he'd get his little key out and undo the padlock, man. And you'd open it up and you'd get your spool of tippet, maybe a little floating or a couple of, you know, Red's Yakima River specials or whatever it was. And he'd hook you up. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Amazing. Yeah, and I we we later moved into that same you know when we when you know my partner here bought the place and we moved the shop was moved in uh, inside that trailer at a later date. You know, it wasn't until quite a bit later. You know, and we started to sell rods and waders and stuff. When I mean, we didn't sell, we just sold flies, man. And you know, without just pumping the business too much, I just want to tell people like at our core, we are a fly shop. Like we want to sell the best possible flies and help people have the best possible success they have. I think there's a, a lot of places out there that just want to sell you rods, reels, and expensive gear and waders and stuff, man. But we flies are really the core of what we do, and uh, I just think it's incredible. We started kind of with that, like all we sold was flies, retail wise, and some tippet and stuff originally, and we're still kind of all about that. Keep coming, keep the route. I thought this was going to be rapid fire, Dave. Yeah, Let's I know, go, man. I know we lost, we <laughs> lost the rapid. You know what? Somebody called me out a, like, like a, a few months ago, maybe it was a while ago, and said, "Man, you're not very rapid on on the rapid fire." But for me, it's a struggle <laughs> because it's kind of my signal to be like, "Okay, I got to wrap it up here." We're, we're like over an hour, or however long we've been talking, but. But so it's more of a signal to me to let me know. But then when I get into it, I'm like, oh man, I, I don't like the rapid fire. I want to hear the whole conversation. But uh, but let's let's keep it going. Another one here. Um, I do a little bit of bird hunting, and uh, and I haven't done a little bit in a while. But you also have a bird hunting site now. Is that um, just tell us about that? Is that something that uh, you guys have had for a long time, or is that a new thing? Yeah, it's something we have had for a, a long time. It's a great question. I was catching uh, pheasants up, and uh, we have a we have a, pres- a game bird preserve, so we we hunt a lot, but we we supplement the population. Otherwise, we would hunt all the wild birds into extinction or futility uh, pretty quick. So we we release pheasants uh, on a, a licensed game preserve here. We hunt the the birds that we you know uh, release there, and uh, so we have a. Uh, pheasant hunting operation we hunt uh a lot from september through march it's a lot of fun very family oriented beginner oriented uh hunting operation we do just a little bit of wild bird uh hunting as an outfitter uh in some ways we we really think it's our responsibility as an outfitter if we're going to be out guiding people and hunting birds let's hunt birds that have been raised and released and uh you know one i think it's the right thing to do for the other sportsmen that are using all the public land around us uh so we do lots of pheasant hunting great operation we got a great resort here i was you know i was afraid i'd miss the podcast this morning because i was you know uh, running pheasants up to the game preserve oh nice that's awesome <laughs> um, mike yeah it's very family oriented my my boys were, were hunting yesterday uh you know up there uh, my young guys were up helping train dogs uh with with one of our guides up there uh, hmm. yeah it's a cool operation it's a nice way to mix a cast and blast it uh, is especially this especially this time of year when you know, the, the fishing should be awesome today, uh, but it's, it can be cold this time of year here. And so 
the bird hunting fills the gap yeah. and, uh, you know, being able to procure some of your own, you know, own, uh, you know, game bird dinners. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yep. Good way to live. That's cool. And you mentioned uh, along the way, you know, just about the history of reds, you became a partner. I'm not sure what that entails, but can you take us to, you know, like that moment? And, uh, and I asked that because I know there's a lot of people out here that listen to this, that are guides, maybe they're getting started and, you know, and I'm sure they would love to be part of a fly shop, maybe own a fly shop. And I'm, I just want to get a feel for like, you know, when you, when, when you got into that, you know, can you take us to that moment and, and how all that felt? Yeah. You know, I was, I've always, you know, I think I made the comment earlier, uh, you know, and maybe I didn't, maybe I'm going crazy, but, <laughs> uh, you know, when you, when you're a young, you know, college grad, young dad, you know, living in a, du- you know, an 800 square foot duplex with, you know, a beautiful wife, you know, and yep. you feel very obligated to financially support your family. If you're going to do this guide thing, man, you'd better, you'd better do it. Yep. You'd better be all in. And I thought for a few years that I would end up pursuing another career. And there was, I don't know where I was at, at when I had kind of this epiphany, like, no, I'm going to do this. If I'm going to work in outfitting, I'm going to do it right. And man, I really just gave up, you know, several years or, you know, several years of my life to just really dedicating myself to this business might've been five years, 10 years. I don't know. Um, and, uh, you've got to go all in on this thing. And I went all in for, you know, a handful of years, you know, when I came on to reds, I didn't start as partner. Uh, you know, I was brought in, I worked as an employee, you know, with some responsibilities and, you know, uh, you know, Steve here's essentially, he's my best friend. Uh, you know, he was the founder who brought me in and, uh, you know, I gave up a lot, you know, for a lot of years and, and, uh, eventually helped build this place. You know, this is for anybody who's in any job, who's a younger person, maybe, you know, maybe you're 23 years old, maybe you're 30 years old or whatever. And you're part of a company and you, 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 you know, you want responsibility, you want to be a partner, you want a promotion. It's like, you've got to make yourself, you have to make that pie bigger. Like you have to go out of with that mindset, not like, Oh, I'm doing a great job. I get here early. <laughs> and I, you know, I did a great job on that. Who cares? Yep. Unless you, unless you help make that business, you know, double the size that it is or whatever proportion, like, and go figure out ways to, you know, make the business run more efficiently and take on more responsibility. And, uh, you know, I'm really fortunate. That's what I was able to do here. And I came on at a good time and we went from, you know, running our business out of that trailer to, you know, just a, a, a business that we're really, we're just, we're really proud of it because we got such a great team of people and, you know, kind of a whole family around our business here. And, you know, we get to, we get to ship stuff all over the world every day and chat fishing with people. And it's like a dream, but you're going to give up a lot. And, uh, you know, for people that really want to do this, you got to be all in and you got to not expect a damn thing in return. Um, you know, you, you don't go into it with any entitlement. You go at it with, you know, if this doesn't work out, it didn't cost me anything. It really didn't. You know, you, you had a job and, and, and you went into it and you should learn every single skill you can take on every opportunity you can. When somebody, uh, you know, gives you a suggestion or a task, even if you don't know how to do it, you say, yeah, I'll figure it out. Yep. And man, you, you might, you know, there's a lot of early mornings and late nights when, you know, I did, I'm, I'm our e-commerce specialist now. I'm a professional in e-commerce and I still get to go fishing all the time. I have zero formal training in any of that. Exactly. None. But you can, man, I read a lot of essays, a lot of blogs, a lot of articles. Yep. And I, it's all there. I utilize, dude, I utilize a lot of customer support for the tools at our disposal, you know, um, that, that we're now utilizing. So uh, I've been really fortunate, but for anybody who's in the outdoor industry, it's not going to come easy, man. Um, and don't get, you know, don't get discouraged or frustrated, you know, when things don't work out the way they're supposed to just make sure that you're learning as much as you can along the way is because nobody can take that away from you. That's cool. Yeah, I know that's well put. I, I was listening to a podcast, uh, Tom, uh, Roland, he's coming on this show in uh, a little while. And, um, you know, he was talking about, uh, I think the, the, uh, the host asked him about balance, like work-life balance and stuff. And he basically said, you know what? you know, I'm not the, a good person to answer that question because there's times when, you know, as a guide, when he was growing his business before he had a family, there was no balance. It's like, it was just all in and he, he worked harder than any other person, you know, pretty much in the world. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, and that's where it sounds like you're saying the same thing that basically there's no, there's no secret here. You just work your ass off and then eventually, um, you know what I mean? You, you hopefully get a little break. Is that a good summary? 
It's a really good summary. And I think there's a couple of other little, you know, tips I'd give people in retrospect. And it's, if you believe whatever product you're, you're marketing, and it could be a hard good, or it could be a service. If you believe it to be a good product and a good value, don't give up on it. You know, we gave up on way too much stuff here at Reds in the early years, you like our university of fly fishing. You know, we kind of gave up on that. We started it in 2008 and we ran it for a while and we kind of gave up on this multi-year idea. And uh, we're like, ah, we, we just weren't big enough at the time to really make it blossom. And now we've resurrected this idea like fly fishing's hard, man. Like you're not going to go out for a season or a weekend and get good at it. For people who are genuinely interested in becoming good, it's going to take several seasons for them to really become proficient. That's just one little example is if you believe the product you're, pe- you're, you're peddling is good, stick with it. Don't give up. Just stick with it. Don't, you know, I believe in this. My heart is in this. The other one is don't do things that you don't intend to be doing in five years. Like just look at it and go, is that something where I see my identity being wrapped up in that five years from now? And if the answer is no, there's plenty of things that can consume your professional space, right? Or your time. And you should consume all of your professional time should be taken up and they can be little exercises or little practices or, you know, all sorts of little things. But if you're, if you don't intend to be doing those things in five years, just drop them and prioritize exclusively what you really believe in, what you're really good at and what you want to still be doing in five years. And let that be the compass that guides you to how you spend your time. That's and awesome. I spent a lot of time spinning my wheels with this little short term garbage that, you know, ended up, uh, you know, really costing you some, you know, productivity instead of just going, my heart is in this. I believe in it. Let's stick to this. Yeah, that's awesome. I was trying to think of a, uh, a Seth Godin quote, who's a kind of this, uh, epic, uh, person that teaches, uh, kind of marketing and is just real, has lots of quotes, but basically that's, that's the, the quote is I'll put a link in the show notes, but it's something like, you know, you have a dream, you have a goal, stick with it you know, and stick with it even when everybody is against you and saying you shouldn't stick with it because you believe in it, you know, you believe in that product, that service. But if you stick with it long enough, those people that were your naysayers will eventually join you. You know what I mean? Like that's, I'll, I'll, I'll do a way better job and, and may summarize the, the, on the quote itself. But that's what this comes down to is that sometimes, you know, whether it's fly fishing or whatever, people out there are going to talk, even your family, right? I mean, even your family might say you're, you're stupid to go into something, but if you're passionate about it, like life is short, right? Why not just go all in on it? Which is, sounds like, which is what you did. Yeah. Uh, you know, fortunately I, you know, I had family that never, you know, never discouraged me, only encouraged me. They certainly didn't support me, you know, financially at all or anything like that, but never discouraged me. But I do remember, uh, you know, I, I had a degree and I was a forest firefighter before I was a guide and it was a cool job. I worked on hell, hell We flew to all these forest fires. It was awesome. Oh, wow. Good adrenaline rush. Huh. And, uh, there was, and I wanted to get hired at that, that, um, state agency as department of natural resources. And, uh, there was a guy working there. Great, great dude. This isn't meant to be detrimental to, to him or anything, but, um, I was, wor- I was chatting with him, told him, Hey, he's like, Hey, what are you, what are you doing? Oh, I'm still guiding, you know? And, and, uh, yeah, I was like, I'm thinking about applying, you know, for a forester position, you know, or now, you know, anything in the natural resource management field. And, uh, and he was very, he was actually being very polite and very supportive, but he says, Oh, guiding. He's like, yeah, that's kind of a, kind of a Peter Pan fantasy, isn't it? Huh. And, uh, <laughs> I heard that and I go, man, you son of a bitch. You huh. like, no, it's not, you know, like this is real. Like what I do matters. And, uh, I remember hearing him tell that to me and he was being very, he yeah. was actually being kind. Oh, yeah. He was actually supporting me in this direction that I'd given indication that I was interested. He was actually encouraging. So, but I listened to it. And at that moment I knew where my heart was. I was like, no, I'm not going to go apply to be a, a, some type of ologist, you know, like, no, I'm going to be a fishing guide, man. <laughs> and, uh, I had, I had several other jobs in the field. I worked as a land surveyor. And I worked as a, uh, I, I will say, assistant to the fisheries biologist, um, because my degree is not officially in biology. But I went and worked for a fisheries research company, basically doing grunt labor on a bull trout study and a, a migratory salmon study. And it paid great. But I took that job in the off season for four months. And uh, 
both times. I thought that I found my career, you know, being licensed land surveyor would be great. Right. And then being a fish biologist would be great too. And I thought that I found my career and both times spring rolled around. And I literally, the first couple of guide trips that came in that spring, I, I left the other job immediately and went right back to guiding. That's so it. the writing was always on the wall. It was all, that's awesome. Well, let's, let's also take us out of here. And, uh, so the 222, we didn't finish that up. So we had the flies, we had Antonio's and I guess he's got the flies that can probably cover those too. What about, and you've ton, you've thrown out a ton of tips here, but staying on that line, two quick tips for dry fly fishing. Um, you know, maybe if we focus again on mayflies in the winter, spring time, do you have a couple more tips you throw out quickly here? Yeah. Two tips. One, just become extremely good at casting. Okay. Um, tip or, you know, real effortless tip oriented cast, learn how to fly cast extremely well and with minimal body movement. Like most people are, most people are underperform on their cast. 90 plus percent of anglers are very, you know, I would say in, they might think they're good casters. They're not, um, a good caster is a really rare and beautiful thing. Uh, so get really good at casting and practice is free. You guys, okay? I'm not saying this to be discouraging and being encouraging practice is free. Get good at your casting. The next one is don't underestimate the power of presentation. Gary Borger's book on presentation, go buy it. If you can find a copy, I got to tell you, like, man, go buy that book. My dad bought me that when I was about 21 years old. Favorite book I've ever read. Um, and the information is still 100% relevant. Um, so some of the fly patterns, there's been improvements. But, um, you know, Gary's the man. Don't underestimate the power of presentation. Your ability to make that fly, that, that imitation looked act and sound like a bug is infinitely more important than the fly you have or the brand of rod you throw that's it that's it that's awesome yeah we had uh, uh gary borger was on a, a few years ago on on the show and it was a killer episode he actually broke out the uh nymphing because he's kind of the guy that almost invented nymph fishing in the uh you know as we know it but uh but i love mm -hmm. gary gary's awesome so um okay cool well those two tips and then resources now this is obviously for you guys i mean you've got this youtube channel i think it's got like almost forty thousand followers it's got you got tons of resources of your own but if you had to say and you mentioned one there with gary but if you had to say a couple of other resources where you would direct people um what, what would you tell them if we're talking again dry flies and dry fly fishing oh dude i'd, I'd be watching nothing but huge fly fishermen on youtube man yeah. Love huge. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met him, but he's awesome. Uh, yeah. I mean, as far as resources go, I think, but I, you know, the podcast is great and I live, uh, I live kind of in the, the, the e-commerce media world. Um, but I would say books, you know, I would really encourage people to get books, you know, pot, you know, pod, you can't read while you're driving back and forth to work. So there's, don't worry. They're still going to listen to the podcast, yep. Dave. <laughs> um, and hopefully they still watch my YouTube channel. That's people right. are still going to consume electronic media, but um, people should really be looking at books. Um, you know, get George Daniels books, you know, get Gary's book on presentation. There's lots of other books, but um, I think books are really critical because they're the author that, that produced that is an accredited expert. A publishing company would not put that book into print unless that author really had valuable information. A lot of the stuff I do on YouTube, yeah, a lot of it's just tips, but a lot of it, I'm not kidding you. I'm trying to sell you something, right? Yeah. I'm not different than, you know, maybe I am, but I'll be honest with you. I'm trying to sell you something a lot of the time. Yeah. If you get books, you're going to get good at fishing and you're going to come back to reds and ultimately you're going to buy tackle. The better you are at fishing, the more tackle you're going to consume from us. So I really encourage people to get books because they don't lie and they're not trying to sell you anything. George Daniels, his second book, I can't remember the dang name of it, but I just read that at a cabin. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to a, a cabin over Thanksgiving weekend, COVID cabin. Yeah. <laughs> we, my family went up there for Thanksgiving, no other family, just immediate family. And uh, my client that, that uh, gave us the cabin for the weekend um, had that book there. And I read that book and I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, that guy's hot. I mean, just the fact that he puts it in print, explains it, you can flip back. I think that's where I would start is, is looking yeah. for books that are within that field of study of fly fishing that you want to get good at. The internet is wonderful, but it can also send you down a lot of rabbit holes, which where you don't belong. Yeah, totally. Tons of good old information out there. And that's part of the reason why I definitely try to mix it up and get guests, you know, as many of the old school people, you know, as they're around as I can. Um, so that's great. Okay, cool. Well, I think we hit that pretty well. Um, 
yeah, I mean, before we get out here, anything else uh, you want to touch on as far as what you guys have going at Reds or anything, any other stuff on dry fly fishing that we do you feel like we yeah, covered I would, pretty well? I would say one thing, just for all the freeloaders that are listening, um, get in our monthly rod giveaway. Um, we quit spending money on marketing dollars to Google and a bunch of other places, and we decided to give free stuff away. Um, we give away a rod every month. T- today, I'm giving away a, a TNT contact, too. No BS, no gimmicks, no huh. scams, no, none of that crap. You place an order with us with any size. It could be for flies and just, uh, there's a link in our online store, redsflyfishing.com. Go to the monthly rod giveaway. It's fun. We live feed the drawing on the last day of the month every year. The team, we sit around and we live stream. We have a couple of beers. We give away a rod and we give away a handful of other stuff on the last day of every month. So nice. I would just say that's kind of a fun way to connect with us and, uh, you know, get some free stuff. And it's, like I said, it's not a gimmick. Um, it's a, yep. it's a fun thing to get in there and be a part of. Exactly. No, it's awesome. And we're doing some, some similar stuff, uh, coming up this next year. So that's, that's really cool to hear. Okay. And, and what is your, uh, before we get out of here, your drink of choice. So what, if, I, I guess, are you talking beer? If you had to pick one beer after a, a day on the river, what are you going for? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm probably going for a bail, uh, bail breaker, uh, field, oh, yeah. field 41 IPA. Yeah. yeah bail breaker. So, now, what, what was the, what was the name again? Uh, I think it's a uh, field 41. Okay. Field 41. I, yeah. We pour, we, we have a bar in, like literally in our fly shop. Oh, you do. It's Canyon River Grill. It's called Canyon River Grill. We literally have a bar in our fly shop. Amazing. It's the most awesome restaurant and bar ever. Amazing. The bar is called the back Eddie and we're, where the scum accumulates at the end of the day. Uh, uh, <laughs> sort of our joke, but uh, yeah, we have a restaurant bar. We pour, uh, we pour bail breakers. They, their brewery is about 20 minutes. from. Oh, us. it is uh, in Ellensburg, right? Oh. You guys are in Ellensburg. The, yeah. We're halfway between Ellensburg and Yakima, Washington. Yeah. Bail breakers in Yakima, You're you right know, there. home of the hops, right? You're right there. Oh yeah. No, we're, we're in the, the whole, yeah. Northwest for sure is, is hoppy. Crazy hoppy. Okay, and, yeah. and uh, I'm just checking these things off because again, we're not going to talk about the po- your podcast. But since I'm talking to a fellow podcaster, it's pretty unique because there's not you know that many of us that are in the fly fishing space. And you have the mend, which is kind of pretty uh, pretty great, right? So, anything you want to say about that show, like as far as uh, when it comes out or anything, you want to give a shout out to that? Yeah, um, I would say for people, the con- I, you know the content's good. Um, it's a solo podcast, generally me just chatting about tips. You can check it out. Um, I think, you know, I think it's good. I'm not a professional podcaster. I get pulled in a lot of different directions, but I, I like it. Like I said, it's, I think I said this, I don't know if this will be on the podcast or not, but podcasts are one of the last sacred places without clickbait, man. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, it's as close as we can get to a book, you know, in the audio format of people just sharing information and hopefully not trying to sell you too much stuff. Yeah, yeah, and and why and you you first got into that, um, and just just briefly again uh, the podcast. Why did you start that podcast? I mean, you have this killer YouTube channel. Why did you think it was important? Well, I thought it was important because I can do certain things in the podcast, and I need to realign, you know, what that is supposed to be. But for me, I can go to a destination. You know, I recorded one in Russia. I yeah, recorded I heard, one in Chile. I heard the Chile one. That was good. And I've recorded them in Ascension Bay, um, you know, where you're getting like this real time, genuine yep. testimonial about what the adventure is like. Not just like, you know, most people could give a crap about, you know, fishing at those destinations, but you're learning stuff about fish and, and fish behavior and tackle every day that you're there and you're fishing hard. You know, when I go to those other countries, I'm fishing my brains out. Yeah. I'm not there for just there for the vodka, you know, <laughs> I'm there for fishing and, uh, and you're fishing your brains out. So you actually have a lot of reflections to share about tackle and you're really putting your gear to its you know best and, and highest use there. And so I think those podcasts on destination are probably th- where I, the direction I need to take that podcast to, because the editing and the uploading and all that kind of stuff and the connectivity is very challenging. Um, yeah. so yeah, people should check it out. It's not, it's not the wet fly swing. <laughs> um, you know, but it's a, it's kind of just a little homegrown organic podcast that I record in either the cab of my truck or my Jeep, you know, yep. uh, when I find a little time and I've got something to chat about. That's it. That, well, that's the beauty. And that's what we mentioned at the beginning off air is that that's the amazing thing about podcasting is anybody, literally everybody listening right now could probably start a podcast, uh, within a day. I mean, literally, well, it'd probably take a little bit longer, but it, it's, it's, it's become so simple. And the great thing is, is the stories, you know, I mean, today, 
you've shared some stories that I didn't know about. And I think hopefully this is going to be uh, entertaining for people to hear, you know, and you guys will probably get a little more traffic and make some sales as well. But I think bottom line for me, we, we told some stories today and, and that's a success. So, um, so cool, Joe. Hey, I appreciate you uh, sticking around. I know we had some technical difficulties, which I'm going to clean up and post and hopefully nobody will even notice it. But um, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing the story and the tips on dry flies. This is going to be an awesome show. And uh, yeah, man, until we catch up again, we'll, we'll see you then. You bet. Thanks a ton, Dave. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 186. Have you been to our website recently? Uh, and we not only have a summarized list of links uh, from this episode, including a lot of what we talked about on the show notes, but we have a bunch of other uh, blog posts and tips out there, some epics, some bigger stuff, just lots of goodness over there. And I wanted to thank Dan, uh, who reminded me recently uh, of the help that the blog provides. So head over there and take a look if you, uh, if you can. That'd be great. Before we get out of here, I wanted to quick, uh, quickly share a summary of what Joe covered today. And this isn't everything, but just uh, kind of a highlight of a few of those things. So number one, drop the dry fly in so it makes a ring when it drops. If you can do that on like the first cast, that's that's what you need to try to do. Not, not casting, working your way into the fish, hitting the water. Find the fish and drop it right on so it makes that ring. Number two. Uh, a three weight is good in an eight and a half to nine foot range. So again, this is three weight. So go lighter. You know, it's not the nine foot five weight, uh, not even the nine foot four weight, but the three weight, uh, give that a shot. Number three, use tapered leaders from the shop. So, uh, you know, building leaders is not what you need for dry fly fishing. Definitely just go buy a few leaders, have them ready to go. Um, Joe noted the Rio uh, Supple Flex tippets um, and leaders are great. So check those out. Number four, uh, go for 12-foot leaders and 7X if you can. The lighter, the better. He loves using 7X and, and try to go for that. If you are using bigger flies and things like that, maybe there's wind, 7.5-foot, 4X. You can go down to some of that as well. But somewhere in that range is what you need. And on that same line, number five, put on a fresh tapered leader at the start of every trip. So there's no reason to, to screw around here. And this is a great tip because uh, Joe noted, again, breaking off flies. Um, why mess around where you have to, like, add tip it there? Just start with a fresh one and you can break off a few flies and it's no big deal. Number six, simplify your fly selection. Joe noted, like, 12 flies. I think he even talked about with Antonio's flies, you could probably just grab a few money flies that work for you so don't get too crazy the, the fly pattern actually isn't the most important thing it's your presentation which um, again goes into the last couple here um, you know if you can't see your fly you can't um, you can't fish it basically and and joe gave the example of the two old timers that were killer dry fly fishermen um, even though they were older they knew where their fly was that was a key as compared to the young guys that couldn't uh, see the fly as well. And we're just going to take it out here with number eight, good old Gary Borger, who is on a past podcast, uh, kind of the guy, uh, the classic nymph fishing uh, guy you think of. But he also um, had a book on presentation, which uh, I'll try to find a, put that in the show notes uh, so you have that. So uh, so that's a wrap. Uh, before we get out here, just wanted to... Um, Give another shout out, uh, just kind of as a little bonus to our sponsors. I noted Angler's Coffee and Stonefly Nets earlier, and just wanted to give you a you know a heads up just from my uh, personal experience, you know, and obviously uh, they're a sponsor of the show, so we want to provide a, an ad here. But man, the Angler's Coffee, I drank that first bag, and it is really good coffee. Um, I mean, as good as anything else that I've been drinking. And I definitely drink a lot of coffee, so so check it out. I, I this is uh, this is legit. Definitely, Angler's Coffee is good. So you can go to wetflyswing.com/anglers um, to check that out. And also Stonefly Nets. I have one of their nets, and it's just you know it's a custom, beautiful net from a small little mom and pop. You know, Ethan, the founder there. Uh, there's a video that um, I'll put in the show notes of Ethan. I think it's a little three-minute clip. But again, a really nice net, a really cool guy, a really cool company. So if you can support, if you need a net like I did, I needed a net. Um, and now I have a killer net. If you want a really nice net uh, from a you know handcrafted 
a one of a kind sort of thing, check out Stonefly. You'll be supporting a good company and supporting this podcast if you can. You can go to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to take a look there and, and just click over and have a look. So, um, yeah, just want to thank you for hanging on here till the very end. We are late in the night kicking this one out. Uh, I don't even want to say what time it is because it's late, late, late. It's, uh, it's late. Um, but I'm looking forward to catching up with this soon and hope to maybe connect with you uh, online or maybe uh, on the river. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.